Morning, everybody. It's Dr. Gillard here. This is the first lecture of, uh, what is it? It's spring 2020. It's week one. Here we go. Uh, we are going to be talking about blood vessels, the anatomy, histology, a little physiology, kind of get that up to speed. And then we're going to talk about something very important called the beaver dam and its concept. And we'll I talk about beaver dams a lot in this class. Uh, I built this class uh, from these books. Of course, Robbins and uh, Cotran are classic. Uh, Robbins has been around forever. These are Board of Chiropractic Examiner books, Robin and Rubin, Robbins and Rubens. Uh, really good storyteller, Porth Pathophysiology. Uh, maybe not quite deep enough, but she's a very good storyteller. Uh, Guyton, of course, is Guyton. I mean, none of these books, Robbins and Rubens, absolutely terrible storytellers. Uh, Porth just crushes them, in my personal opinion, although she's not deep enough. Uh, and then uh, the labs were built with Board of Chiropractic Examiner reference books. And as I've said before, why do I use Board of Chiropractic Examiner reference books? Because that is the only place that board questions come from, period. Uh, Bates is what I used to build the labs, and Seidel, I don't know if I put that in here, Seidel's another one. Jarvis is not a Board of Chiropractic Examiner books. And then, yeah, we'll talk about the the uh, heart books when we get to the heart uh, portion. But you can tell I've put an awful lot of work into this class. All right, but let's get going. The purpose today is to review the circulatory system, and that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> circulatory system is like a super highway in the body, right? It connects uh, blood vessels of various sizes, connects every piece of tissue with oxygen uh, and carbon dioxide uh, via the blood. From the tip of your nose to the tip of your little finger to inside of your liver, every place has blood vessels. What's their job? They deliver oxygen to the tissues which need such oxygen to stay alive. They take carbon dioxide away and other wastes away. It also helps with immunosurveillance. If you get <clears throat> bacterial or viral infection in your blood, a circulatory system will tell the bone marrow and the spleen to start cranking up new white blood cells to fight that infection. There's two main divisions of the circulatory system, cardiovascular system, Lymphatic system, well, maybe not so familiar with that one. We'll look at that a little bit when the time comes. Let's focus on the cardiovascular system. It has four key components. <clears throat> the pulmonary system, uh, and we'll take a look at that in a minute, There's a, which is basically just the right side of the heart, how it pumps blood to the lungs, back to the left side of the heart. That's the pulmonary Pretty easy job, right? If you're right heart myocardial cell, you got a pretty easy life as long as things don't go wrong. Then we have the systemic circulation, also known as the peripheral system or the peripher peripheral loop or systemic loop or systemic circuit. That's basically the left heart and all the pipes that go out of the left heart and come back to the right heart is that loop. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, the heart is actually part of the cardiovascular system. We know that. Maybe you don't know this one, the calf muscle pump, the soleus muscle in particular. Uh, there's no heart. How does the blood get out of your lower extremities? Not very easily, but uh, there is a calf muscle pump system. Mainly the soleus is filled with a honeycomb of venous blood vessels. And every time you're up and walking, they squeeze the blood out of the calf. Same with the hamstrings. Quadriceps also help contribute to pumping the blood out of your calves. And of course the lungs are part of the cardiovascular system as well. And here's just a little cartoon of that. Here's the right heart. I talk about the right and left heart. This is a nice cartoon of the right heart here. And we pump blood out of the pulmonary trunk here. It's just a cartoon. There would be two pulmonary arteries, right? Oxygenated blood into the lungs back to the left atrium. Uh, this is the right circuit here, or the right, or the uh, pulmonary loop. The 
peripheral loop or the systemic loop is much larger, right? There's the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, the descending aorta, and it goes every nook and cranny of your body. Uh, it even some of it <clears throat> even goes to the lungs, right? You, the lungs are tissue, and some the lungs are also supplied by arterial blood. So if you're a left heart myocardial cell, you have to be pretty strong and in good shape because that's a tough that's a tough gig. It's just a cartoon uh, showing the heart and how the blood goes everywhere. It's really important that you guys understand what these major highways are. I'm going to talk about them time and time again, especially when we talk about beaver dams, uh, as we'll see. Uh, so it's important to understand and bring back the uh, what's the what's what are the three takeoffs from the aortic arch. Uh, right, uh, so so bring all that stuff back up to the surface, uh, so you'll understand when we're talking about it. All right, let's meet the beaver and the beaver dam. Uh, so this is the beaver. This you guys probably never seen this. A sh famous show back when I was little, I used to watch it, called Leave It to Beaver. Always getting in trouble, very mischievous. Another mischievous beaver. Uh, so that's the beaver. So let's talk about the beaver dam concepts. Uh, what do beavers like to do? They like to dam things up for whatever reason. Uh, they like to find a stream that's flowing and dam it up. Can you think of any relation to cardiovascular pathology where this might come into play? How about atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic placking? Yeah, <clears throat> kind of the same thing. It dams, it dams things up and or a tumor pushes on a blood vessel can dam it up. Uh, so kind of an important concept. So uh, in a river, uh, the flow of water, blood moves downstream. That's another important concept of upstream and downstream, proximal or distal. <clears throat> water tends to move downstream. That's called distal. Uh, upstream to some reference point is means upstream. It's upstream or proximal to some downstream reference point. We'll use some illustrations here. A perfect example is a kayak on the river. So if we're using this as the reference point, this guy back here is upstream uh, to this, this kayak. And maybe uh, this piece of river right here, if there's another boat right here, that would be downstream. Everybody's good with that, right? So that's an important concept. Okay, beaver dam. So if you dam up a river or if you dam up a blood vessel, it causes a buildup of water upstream. So the beaver was at work right here. He built a dam. And the water upstream, look at how wide it's backed up. Same thing can happen in arteries. And this backup, who knows how far this could go. This could go for miles and miles depending on the force uh, of the flow in the in the completeness of the beaver dam. <clears throat> Yet downstream, uh, now this is a fairly leaky beaver dam, so we don't have water squirting out, uh, but we have a slow flow. What if this dam was 100% solid except for one little hole the size of a quarter? How would the water be coming out of that hole? It'd be shooting out of that hole, right? High pressure. Uh, but after it settled down, it would be back to a, a slow kind of flow. So sometimes that happens in a beaver dam. It's almost like putting your finger over a garden hose. Uh, you can get some high spray, but that doesn't mean the volume is high. It just means that the, the point where uh, the leak is is very, very narrow. So that's another important concept. And as I said, we could use the beaver dam with the bloodstream. So here is a patient who developed atherosclerosis, and it, his or her atherosclerosis went to the end phase, which is uh, atherosclerotic placking. And the, pla the placking have gotten underneath the tunica intima, and they've, we'll talk about this in detail, um, but they've narrowed the flow. This is the lumen of blood flow, and all of the sudden, we have a beaver dam. It's not a complete beaver dam, 
but we're having ischemia downstream from this. There's not a lot of red blood cells. Look at there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, there's about 10 blood, uh, red blood cells. But look at how many red blood cells there are up here. See, and it's even stretching things out above. This is a perfect beaver dam concept. And this could back up uh, miles. It could back up all the way down to the feet if it's bad enough. And we'll look at that concept here in a second. <clears throat> there's three types of arteries. Uh, again, there's, a, uh, or there's th three blood vessel types. There's arteries or an arterial system made up of large, medium, and small. And arterials are the smallest member of the artery system. There's capillaries. There's three different types. We actually looked at those yesterday in endocrinology. I think we looked at that. We looked at it somewhere. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over those again. There are There's a venous system made up of venules or venules small, medium, and then large uh, veins. Who can give me an example of a large vein? Good, that would be the inferior and superior vena cava. Those are about as big as they get. Okay, so you remember that stuff. Uh, the Another property there, another concept that's important to understand is elasticity, um, especially with, well, veins too are important. Uh, so arteries are, the blood travels under high pressure, right? The left heart squeezes very hard, uh, and blood comes flying up, up the ascending aorta. <clears throat> and surprisingly, those big pipes are quite elastic, and they dissipate the blast of blood coming out of the ventricle. All right, but how do they dissipate it? They stretch a little bit, therefore the pressure is actually reduced. Well, what happens when diastole occurs and no pressure is imparted on that blood? Well, the blood keeps flowing because the arteries contract and it drives blood further downstream. And it also drives blood backwards and helps close the semilunar valves. Uh, so that's a very important concept. Right? <clears throat> so this elasticity during diastole propels blood downstream because of the recoil of the arteries, and it propels blood from basically the ascending aorta. It propels blood upstream, in, and that helps shut the semilunar valves, especially the aorta. So that's an important concept. I think you guys know that. The smallest member of the arterial system is the arteriole, or the artery system is the arteriole. Uh, and that is a member of what's called the microcirculation. It, arterioles, pound for pound, have more tunica media than any other blood vessel. Uh, they're a very muscular uh, little beast. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, if they have a lot of muscle in the tunica media, we can control the diameter of the lumen uh, by contracting and relaxing that arterial. And therefore, they are super, they are blood pressure arterials. In fact, one of the types of arterial sclerosis is one you've probably never heard called arteriolosclerosis, named after arterioles. And we'll look at that when the time comes. Uh, but that's the most important cause of hypertension is uh, is a problem with the arterioles and arteriolosclerosis. We'll get to that, though. <clears throat> uh, capillaries, of course, are in between the arterial and venous system, specifically between, normally, between arterioles and venules. Uh, they are the other member of the microcirculation, three different types we've talked about before. They have various degrees of leakiness, depending on what type they are. They serve as a barrier between the interstitium and the cells, uh, as well as the blood. Uh, <clears throat> one of their jobs is to provide servicing for the interstitium and its cells. How can that happen as I take a drink of water? <clears throat> 
Well, that's where the oxygen leaves the proximal capillary. CO2 returns via the distal capillary. Uh, and so we'll see a picture of that in a minute. They're also surrounded by lymph capillaries, which are blind-ended tubes. They're not continuous. And they can be turned on and off, too. Uh, epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, for example, targets targets the tunica, media, uh, the tunica media of some of the dermal blood vessels. And if you're bleeding, it can turn off your skin, uh, the blood flow to your skin. That's why people who are bleeding have hemorrhagic shock. They get real cold and clammy looking uh, because adrenaline's been released, a.k.a. epinephrine's been released, and it can shut off the skin to conserve blood. Why? Who cares about the skin? The brain's way more important, so that needs that gets oxygen first. And we talked about this yesterday a little bit, <clears throat> uh, but here's the microcirculation. There's an arterial, venial, or venial, and here's a capillary. And for every capillary, everywhere in the body, you never see. They always draw capillaries naked by themselves, but there's always a lymphatic capillary, a lymph capillary inside intermingled. Anybody know why? Why do we have lymph capillaries there? Well, because interstitial fluid, and we'll look at better picture of this in a minute, but interstitial fluid is being pushed out. This is under higher hydrostatic pressure here. Uh, so we're getting some blood fluid draining out, which is a good thing because here comes the nutrients and the oxygen and uh, nitrogen come out up here but it's a little bit too much fluid. Now, down here, we'll look at oncotic forces, start to pull the excess fluid back uh, inside uh, at the distal capillary, but it can't pull all of the fluid back. So thank goodness for these, uh, these lymph capillaries. They soak up the extra interstitial fluid, and that gets... And interstitial fluid is nothing more than blood fluid that was driven out here. Okay, that's interstitial fluid. Once it leaves the blood, it becomes interstitial fluid, but it's just blood fluid. And it, most of it's returned here, but not all of it. The excess is soaked up by these capillaries so you don't swell. Okay, we'll talk about that concept more when the time comes. Here's a nice blow up of this whole situation, but here's the upstream capillary. <clears throat> you can see how oxygen molecule is being driven out because the pressure is higher here. Uh, the red blood cells are too big to go out between the endothelial cells, but the oxygen is servicing. It's swimming. We talked about the interstitium and how this swims. It's swimming and servicing all these cells. Down here, oncotic pressure rules. The hydrostatic pressure is kind of petered out. Oncotic pressure, is it higher here or lower, oncotic pressure? We'll cover this again in a second. It's the same. Oncotic pressure is the same. Um, so, But here we have carbon dioxide being soaked back up. Okay. So as I just said, capillaries are fairly low in pressure, so blood moves fairly slowly through them. Uh, <clears throat> and that gives time for the oxygen to uh, be pushed out of the capillaries, carbon dioxide to be returned to the capillaries. Everything I said. Hydrostatic pressure gradient. <clears throat> the proximal capillary has higher pressure, and the downstream distal capillary has lower pressure. Solid moves in here, can be sucked up from the interstitial fluid. It's pushed out from the blood and creates interstitial fluid here. Oncotic pressure is greater than hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. Where's that picture? Here it comes. This is a key picture, <clears throat> and it should be a complete review. And physiologically speaking, it's a little bit watered down, right? Because there's, uh, there's other pressures at work. But in general, these are the key ones, the best way to think of it. Here's the microcirculation. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Not good. My voice is going already. It's only Tuesday. <clears throat> so, so here we have that everything I talked about, a cartoon of a capillary without all the loops here. Uh, so we have High pressure here, which is not that high, 30 millil uh, millimeters of mercury is not super high, but it's high enough to drive out, get the interstitial fluid kicked out 
of the of the capillary and oncotic pressure so now who causes what is oncotic pressure who causes that who causes oncotic pressure albumin albumin and other globulin and other big giant proteins that float through the blood uh, I like to think of it as a gravity they have a pulling force like gravity they're pulling uh, on the interstitium they're sucking on the interstitium it's a little more complicated than that right but <clears throat> it's a good way to think of it because albumin is huge compared to all the other stuff so because albumin is so big it can't leave normally leave the capillary uh, so it, it creates a constant sucking force these arrows are all the same size here it gets overpowered because the hydrostatic pressure is too powerful and so that's why interstitial blood fluid is pushed into the interstitium to become interstitial fluid but that pressure peters out as you go distally by the time you get down here the oncotic pressure is not very high and the un or, i'm sorry the hydrostatic pressure is not very high the oncotic pressure is the same it's but now it's stronger than the hydrostatic pressure see the arrow there's the hydrostatic pressure has lost super strong here with a big arrow not very strong here so we got a suction force and extra fluid is sucked back in right here as well as carbon dioxide and wastes and things like that so that's very important concept we'll talk about that again so make sure you get that into your noodles uh, super important uh, when we talk about uh, let's see how about someone who was burned real bad let's say this is someone's hand and was burned really bad uh, the burning damages these capillaries to the point the albumin can start to leak out if your albumin leaks out in this region you're not going to have any oncotic pressure so therefore you're going to swell like crazy because you can't return that fluid you get a buildup the lymph capillary will try to suck some of it away but it, it's not enough it gets overwhelmed and you swell okay uh, venules so venules are still part of the microcirculation they don't have any valves yet they do have a pretty muscular wall just like arterioles not quite as muscular as arterioles but they're still they're important with blood pressure because we can control that tunica media that thickness I'll actually go over those layers here in a minute okay there's a post capillary venule here veins in general of course they they're bringing deoxygenated blood it's still got some oxygen in it it's not completely void of oxygen but it's bringing deoxygenated blood back to the heart back to the lungs so carbon dioxide can jump off and they can reoxygen can or oxygen can jump back in uh, it also has a reservoir function so most of the blood in your body is actually in veins veins are super stretchy uh, and therefore veins have a high uh, reservoir ability so we know these words are important I'll, I'll assume you know these words compliance is the stretchiness so veins are very uh, have a high compliance higher than arteries even though the ascending aorta is fairly compliant it's stretchy but the ascending aorta's capacitance is nothing compared to the inferior vena cava or superior vena cava uh, veins have more of a reservoir function and that's called capacitance some veins have valves have evolved especially in the lower extremities because it's hard to get blood out of those things and yeah some uh, some uh, va some valves are in places you wouldn't expect the gonadal veins the ovarian uh, veins and the testicular veins are filled with valves and that we're going to talk about that with regard to bph but I'm prosthetic hyperplasia might have something to do with those. Okay, as I said, there's tunica media. There's still enough tunica media uh, in veins. But, I mean, the venules have tons of tunica media. Veins can't control blood pressure. But they have enough tunica media 
where if you want to inject the heart with a big blast of blood, you can contract even the, the inferior and superior vena cava can, can be squeezed a little bit. And you can squeeze blood in that heart. If there's a, t- cyber, uh, a tiger jumps out of the woods and chases you, sympathetics will contract all the muscles or all the, the tunica media and it'll contract the tunica media in the large veins as well, and it'll squeeze a whole bunch of blood into your heart. The heart will stretch, and remember Frank Starling's law, when the heart stretches, it contracts super hard, much stronger than normal, and that'll get you jump-started. Okay, and then, of course, veins, they get bigger and bigger. The pressure gets lower and lower. In fact, by the time the blood gets back to the heart, it's only about 4 millimeters of mercury. Okay, the heart is another important concept. We looked at it a little bit, but it's a two-sided heart. Uh, There's a left and right side. The left heart drives the sympathetic loop or the the systematic loop. We looked at that. The right heart drives that little pulmonary loop. Right heart's got a cush job, really easy to be right-sided heart. Got to know this. You you better get this burned in your brain because you're going to be lost when I start, start talking about mitral valve pathology or stenosis or regurgitation of the tricuspid valve. Uh, you, this, you have to know these parts, so it's a good time to study these. See, very excited. Look at all the stars here. So let's go through it. So here's the blood flow through the heart. Superior vena cava uh, comes, dumps blood into the right atrium. Inferior vena cava dumps blood into the right atrium. There's a coronary sinus uh, down in this region as well. That's the fossil volus right there, which we'll talk about. I didn't draw the coronary sinus. I forgot to turn on my drawing tools, but I could draw it here. Uh, but that that's draining the heart itself from blood. All that blood goes through, that's this called? Tricuspid valve. And the blood fills up the right ventricle. And then during systole, the blood is ejected through. This is called the pulmonic valve or pulmonary valve. We never, ever in pathology call this the right semilunar valve. Just don't do it. That's just an anatomy thing. This is the pulmonary valve or pulmonic valve. Blood goes up the pulmonary trunk, splits into two pieces. These are pulmonary arteries or veins? Must be artery. It says artery. Uh, Deoxygenated or oxygenated blood? Deoxygenated blood. How come it's called an artery then? I thought arteries had oxygenated blood. No, it's any blood that moves away from the heart. That's, that pipe is called an artery, right? So that, that, the lungs aren't drawn in here, but it goes over. Here's a lung, uh, gets some oxygen. It comes back double-sided, right? Uh, so there's these are pulmonary veins because oxygenated blood is returning to the heart. Uh, there's two more pipes on this side. So we got four pipes draining into the left atria. We got really two main pipes draining into the right atria. But we have a third little one, that coronary uh, ostium to the coronary sinus. So really three pipes drain, one little pipe and two big ones. Okay, once we get into the left atria, remember there's the atrial systole that f- tops off the left ventricle. Left ventricle is filled passively, probably about... Oh, I don't know. You have to ask Dr. Dole for sure on that, but I would I would guess probably 85, 90% passive f- fill of the left ventricle. And that to top off the ventricle, we need to squeeze the rest of the blood out of here through atrial systole. Okay, these valves right here are super important. Never, ever, ever call these the bicuspid valves. These are always called mitral valves in, uh, in pathology. Okay, systole occurs. Super important valve right here. This is the aortic valve. Uh, you get you screw up this aortic valve. Some say it's as bad as having cancer. This is a really under high pressure. It's not good when this valve goes uh, goes bad. Uh, they can replace it, but uh, that's going to change your life if that happens. Anyway, uh, so blood is goes up the ascending aorta, comes around the aortic arch. Uh, goes off brachiocephalic trunk here. What's this one? Good left common carotid artery. What's this one? 
left subclavian artery. Make sure you know that stuff. All right, so that's the trip through the heart. All right, super important beaver dam concept. Uh, let me get a drink of water. You can read that. Got to keep this voice going because I have all those first quarter classes to do the same thing for. Okay, so left heart be comes a beaver dam. This is the the story. So what if you what if a beaver dam occurs in your left heart right here? Let's say what if these valves become stenotic? What if you have mitral valve stenosis? Or what if you have aortic valve stenosis? And the blood can't get through here very good, just like a beaver dam. What's going to happen? Well, just like a beaver dam, you're not going to have a lot of blood going out uh, of the aorta. And you're going to get a backup. Here's the key. You're going to get a backup of blood. And the blood is going to back up into the right. If Let's say we got just aortic stenosis. The blood will back up into the right atrium stretch, or left atrium stretch it out. The blood will back up into the lungs and stretch it out. Let's look at my little drawing. Now, don't laugh at my drawings. We'll come back to that, man. Don't laugh at my drawings. This is why I don't draw on the board. Uh, and this is actually improved version over last quarter. It was even more terrible. <clears throat> but here we go. So here's my cartoon. So we got a beaver dam in here. And you know that we already went through the normal blood flow. But let's look at the players here because these are all clinically important. Here's an external jugular vein, right? It's going to turn into the superior vena cava, okay? Um, let's see. Yes, because we're talking about veins. All right, uh, there's the pulmonary trunk, feeds the lungs, so the blood is going like this, right, through the left. I didn't draw the aorta here, just so we can keep it clean. Uh, there's the inferior vena cava goes into the liver. Uh, we have a pulmonary, or we have a portal vein, right? Portal vein goes in to the spleen. Now, of course, the blood is moving this way, right? We're draining toward the heart, uh, but I'm going backwards. Uh, so here's the inferior, or inferior vena cava again. It's going into the peritoneal cavity or peritoneal cavity, tomatoes, tomatoes. I went to a medical school that was British, uh, so they said peritoneal cavity. I just can't get that out of my head. So, uh, But you should call it really the peritoneal cavity. just doesn't have a good ring to it, though. Peritoneal cavity has a nice flow to it. But anyway, it can go all the way down to the feet. Uh, so so the, that's, the, that's the anatomy. So let's look to see. And there's the, we already went through the normal flow right there. There's the normal flow. Now let's put the beaver dam. So here's the beaver dam, and now the purple arrows are what happens. Maybe it's a little beaver dam. It's just early stenosis. Maybe the backup of blood just goes into the lungs. You start to get a little pulmonary hypertension, right? That can start to affect the right heart. The right heart has to pump harder to push through the beaver dam, and it can usually overcome it at first. But if this is more severe, the worse this beaver dam gets, the further the backup of blood goes, it can get so bad that it actually makes your carotid or your jugular vein bug out uh, when you take a breath. That's called Kuzmol sign. We'll look at that when the time comes. And if you got Kuzmol sign, the blood is also backed up into the liver. You have you have a swollen up liver, hepatomegaly, because of the beaver dam. Uh, in fact, if you take your fingers and poke under the cost of margin, poke into the liver, you can actually make your your jugular vein bug out uh, when you do that. Um, and if it's this bad, it's probably starting to collect fluid in the peritoneal cavity. And that's called ascites. Uh, and you'll have splenomegaly. If you have hepatomegaly because of a beaver dam, the odds are you're starting to get or, or have splenomegaly as well. Why? Because that's where the pipes were going the opposite direction of blood flow. If you have ascites, your ankles are going to be swollen, especially if you have to stand a lot. So that's called dependent, means 
in a position of downstream from gravity. So that's dependent edema. So super, super important concept right here. Beaver dam concept. So here's everything that I just said. So all fair game. And we're going to get into all that stuff much more deeply, but I wanted to start that the very first day so you start to understand that. Everybody good with that? All right, here's a patient who have a beaver dam. He had mitral valve stenosis. Let me go back to this one second too. So does the beaver dam, it doesn't always have to be like a structural beaver dam. It could be a functional beaver dam. What if, what if the left heart is failing in this patient and it just can't pump blood out of the heart enough? What will happen? Same thing. The heart will act like a beaver dam because you got blood waiting to get pumped out of the heart, but it can't, it can't get in here. So it can't get in here to get out. So that heart failure can also act as a beaver dam. Okay. All right, so that's enough of that, and we'll we'll definitely come back to that as we go through this. So let's talk a little bit about blood, blood vessel walls. Uh, so we all the, let's get the tunica. Another concept you should have like down cold, because I'm going to assume that you do, and, and your brain has to understand when I talk about things, it has to be able to visualize things, and so you need to bring these back to the surface if you don't already. So we have a tunica adventitia is the outer layer of the blood vessel. Tunica media is the muscular layer of a blood vessel. Tunica intima is the inner layer which the blood contact with the tunica intima. Uh, and we'll look at, let's look at those more closely here. Meet the tunics. So arteries and veins have all three of these tunics as well. Uh, if I want to talk about all of them in one word, I can say the blood vessel wall. That means the tunica intima, media, and adventitia. Watch out for the AKAs too, tunica intima, uh, tunica interna, strong AKA. Some authors use that. Some authors switch back and forth between these in the same text. It's the innermost layer. Tunica media, there's no AKA for that. Tunica adventitia, strong AKA is tunica externa. It's the outermost layer. Okay, histology days, tunica media has those cigar-shaped cells, uh, and that's tunica media. Tunica intima, the blood would be here, right? There's even some red blood cells, a uh, little blood left in this specimen. But tunica intima, those are the nuclei, those little black things. Those are the nuclei of the epithelial cells that make up the tunica intima. We'll look at that in a second. Actually, the second's over, so let's look at it now. Uh, so... Uh, it's the innermost layer of a vein or capillary artery. Uh, even the heart has a tunica intima. It's in direct contact with the blood. It makes it, Now here's a little histology board question. It's made up of three or four layers depending on where you are. Remember that there's internal elastic laminae in arteries but not in veins. So veins don't have this Swiss cheese layer. They don't have an external elastic laminae either. So therefore, veins have three layers to the tunica media. Arteries, which are under more pressure, have four layers. So good histology question. All right, so what are the layers of the tunica media? Again, depending on where you are, arteries and veins all have an endothelial layer, which is made up of simple squamous cells. Single layer, it's in contact with blood, super biologically active. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that comes out, like von Willebrand factor. Uh, we're going to look at the stuff that comes out of these cells. They are super important to life. They don't float in the air, though. They don't just connect to the tunica media. They have to sit on something, and they sit on a basal lamina like most epithelial does. It's a connective tissue layer, uh, and it, it gives support to the endothelial cells. Underneath that, is a subendothelial layer of connective tissue, not very exciting at all. And then in arteries only, not veins, there is a Swiss cheese layer called the internal elastic laminae. Um, not present in the venous system, and what it does, we don't really know what the heck it does. 
So it may give some extra support is the thought for the higher pressure arteries, uh, but we still are trying to understand what that thing does. Really nice drawing here uh, of these layers. So these, you can tell me, is this an artery or vein? Here's the tunica intima. It's got to be an artery, right? There's four layers. There's one, two, three. Oh, no, it's a vein. No, there's, who are we missing? One, two, oh, yeah, there's four layers. Um, so there's the there's the endothelial cells, the simple squamous epithelial cells, right? So that's the endothelium layer. These epithelial cells that you've studied, they make up a single layer thick. Um, those are the endothelial cells. Those are the ones that secrete all kinds of stuff. They sit on this lighter blue layer. Um, so who would that be? That's the basal lamina. They always sit on a basement membrane or basal lamina. Basal lamina sits on a non-important subendothelial connective tissue, darker blue here. And then there's the Swiss cheese layer. See, it looks like Swiss cheese. It's the internal elastic laminae. There's an external elastic laminae as well. So artery or vein, one, two, three. There's four layers. It's got to be an artery. Okay, there's a blow up of the same thing because I could have went to that, talked about it, but there we go. Let's go a little deeper. Now, what do these endothelial cells do? Said they're found everywhere, arterioles, arteries, capillaries. They're found in the lymph system. It has an endothelial layer made of simple squ uh, squamous as well. Uh, they're found in the heart, except in the heart, you don't call it the endothelial layer. You call it the endocardial layer, but it's this, pretty much the same thing. Histologically speaking, it's made of a single layer of cells. Um, but, it, I mean, it's made of four layers. So the innermost layer is made up of a single layer. So those are simple squamous epithelial cells. And this concept is showing you that the epithelial cells, depending on how big or small the artery is, uh, epithelial cells connect with each other to make up the lumen. So this is a pretty small, maybe an arterial. Uh, it's got one, two, three, four, maybe five, maybe a piece here, six epithelial cells are needed to make the lumen. And our, and uh, a capillary is so small that one epithelial cell can fold completely around and, and make that. Okay, so it just depends. And the aorta has probably 30, 40, 50, 100 maybe. I don't know what the figure is, but it has a lot of endothelial cells to make the lumen of the ascending aorta. But the luminal surface, these epithelial cells, are very busy. Um, they express things. They can release things. They also have receptors that float in the blood. Um, and they, they can capture and snag things that pass by. I wonder if I can draw. Let's see. Does this have a drawing function? Without messing things up, I'm scared to mess things up. There's a pen. There is one here. Uh, so here's an endothelial cell. Here's another one. Here's the blood flowing this way. So there's a bunch of receptors, right, that stick out of the top of these things, like histamine receptors, uh, insulin receptors, make that one a little different. And then we have these weird little LDL receptors. Uh, those guys are, are really important. Let's see. What if, there's a quick way to erase. No, that's this takes too long. I should have started that other program I was using, but I forgot, and I don't want to stop this because Camtasia can sometimes lose your whole recording, and I do not want that to happen. Okay, here's another cartoon. I guess I could have just went right here. Uh, there's the lipid bilayer of a cell. This is epi the cytosol would be in here, and here's an LDL uh, receptor. And what's its job? Its job is to grab a passing LDL cell uh, and then pull it, kind of reel it in to the cytosol. So LDL receptors grab LDLs floating around. Uh, they pull them inside the cell safely. Uh, LDLs can be broken down to go into the lysosome, some of it, and broken down into pieces, and those pieces can be used uh, for whatever they need to use them for. So what about an LDL mutation? 
What if the gene that makes this, right? Where, where's the gene? How's this made? They don't last forever. They have to be replaced. Where, how do you make that if you're a cell? Well, you got to go into the nucleus, right? You, there's on the DNA, on the chromosome, maybe it's chromosome 12, there's a, a sequence of genes that code for this. And remember the central dogma, the, uh, the DNA is read by a DNA or an RNA polymerase reads it and creates a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA swims out of the nucleus, finds a ribosome. The ribosome transcribes it into uh, the ribosome transcribes it into the, the building blocks of this molecule. Um, so what if you have a mutation in, in the coding or somewhere, uh, probably in the DNA? What if this thing is broken or doesn't work very good? Well, there's nobody to grab LDL. So you're going to have high levels of LDL. Uh, you're also going to have hypercholesterolemia. So you have hypercholesterolemia, hypolipoproteinemia. Those are high LDL levels. Why in the world would you have high cholesterol from this scenario? How does cholesterol travel in the bloodstream? Oh, now you remember. Uh, it rides on LDL. It actually rides inside LDL molecules. Here's an LDL, the little ball. We'll cut it open so we can see what it looks like. And sure enough, you have cholesterol. Cholesterol esters are the travel form of cholesterol, but still cholesterol. Yeah, you have its package. This thing is packed with LDL molecules. Okay, uh, so if you have a mutated LDL receptor, and this can't be taken into the into the tunica intima and gotten out of the bloodstream, this will eventually break down and release all this cholesterol into the blood. So you have hypercholesterolemia as well, right? Everything I just said. Cholesterol and these LDLs are very mischievous. I mean, this is atherosclerosis. We'll go over this when the time comes. But ath but these LDLs, if they find damaged endothelial cells, especially where the tight junctions are broken, LDLs like to burrow in between the epithelial cells and get underneath the epithelium of blood vessels. And when that happens, all hell breaks loose. You get a wicked inflammation process in some cases. That's atherosclerosis. That's the start of atherosclerosis. We'll talk about that more when the time comes. But the end phase of the atherosclerosis process is this, and that's atherosclerotic placking. Got it? What about the function? So function, so these darn epithelial cells, these guys are very, very busy. They secrete a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the prostacyclin is one of the slippery three. That we'll look at the other ones that go with prostacyclin, laminin, collagen. Endothelin and nitric oxide we need to talk about. We'll do that the next lecture. Uh, von Willebrand factor, three very important ones. So lots of stars here. I always ask a question on this. So make sure you know that. Uh, so very important enzyme sits on endothelial cells. We talked about ACE yesterday. So ACE lives on, on the epithelial cell. Uh, so especially the epithelial cells in the lung. Let's try to draw again. Maybe next time I will remember to turn on my pen program. So here's a, here's a blood vessel going through the lung. Again, this is why I don't draw. Here's an epithelial cell right here. So let's look at that epithelial cell by itself. Uh, there's ACE right there inside the lumen. So this is ACE, right? ACE. So that's super important. ACE is looking for its mate. And one of its, who's its mate? Angiotensin 1 is its mate, right? So it grabs, here comes angiotensin 1. It binds to that. Angiotensin 1 
is converted into angiotensin to this guy. All right, Tasmanian devil, we'll talk about him. Who else uses ACE? Oh, yeah, COVID-19. There's this evil little monster. COVID-19 also uses binds to. This is how he sticks or she or whatever it is. It's a it, right? I don't think it's viruses really aren't even alive. But that's where it binds to. And then it once it binds, it can burrow into the cell, infect this epithelial cell. They multiply like crazy in here. The body attacks this thing. You get a wicked inflammation and the inflammation starts to starts to spill out into the lungs, into the alveoli, which are all around, and this gets all filled up and it's it's a big mess for some people. Anyway, let's turn that off. Get my laser pointer back. All right. Yeah, so everything I said. Uh, it also, the endothelial function, we're talking about the functions, it also protects the, uh, from bug, it tries to protect from bugs squeezing between. I mean, the virus goes right through. It doesn't bother going between the cells. There's tight junctions that usually do that. Uh, so there's three ways. I cut all these slides out. We, I don't want to do too much review, but simple diffusion, active transport, receptor-mediated into cytosis, fenestrations. There's different ways through, to, for molecules to get out of the blood and into the parenchyma of the lung or uh, into the interstitium of any tissue through those receptors. I cut all that stuff out, though. Uh, the nonstick surface, though, the epithelial lining needs to be slippery because there's a lot of blood platelets floating around in the blood, and you don't want them sticking together, right? So you can be Ant-Man and go inside your blood vessels with a can of Ant-Man Pam from the Ant-Man supermarket, and you can spray the blood vessel walls. That's not really how it works, though. But same concept. Uh, the epithelial lining secretes a really slippery a layer so blood platelets don't stick and that's a good thing if blood vessels if blood platelets start sticking to the walls of the the epithelium if they start sticking to the epithelial cells that is the process of thrombosis kind of known as clotting you shouldn't really call it clotting even though everybody does clotting occurs outside of the blood vessel or in the tunica uh, media will talk about dissecting aneurysms. If it's in the inside of a blood vessel, you shouldn't say clotting. The process of thrombosis occurs. There's a difference. There's a histological difference between that. Uh, who cares about that? Well, that's a beaver dam, right? Thrombosis is a beaver dam starting to develop. But the problem with thrombosis is a piece of the thrombus can break loose and be like a bomb floating downstream. Maybe not so bad if it's in your venous side because it's going to end up in your lungs. If it happens from your, let's say, your your perineal or your peroneal vein. You get a thrombus formation. It breaks loose. Think of the blood vessels. Where does it end up? It ends up in the lungs. But what if it's in your right left atria and you get thrombus formation and breaks loose? Then where can it go? That's why you got to know your blood vessels. It can end up in your brain, right? It could kill you. It could end up going down the coronary artery and causing a heart attack. Uh, so the embolus formation is very, very deadly. We will definitely talk more about that. So how's how you don't spray PAM in there? What do you spray in there? Uh, the lumen is kept slippery by anticoagulant molecules. Who are the slippery three? You got to memorize these. I can almost guarantee you. I usually put these on the test. Prostacyclin, uh, PGI2, tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, thrombomodulin. Those are the slippery three. Those are always secreted by happy endothelial cells or epithelial. I keep seeing endothelial. Epithelial cells. So what if the cells get injured? What if the endothelial cells get injured? What happens? Uh, well, 
we'll see what happens. They, they get upset and they stop secreting some things and they over secrete other things. Uh, but what, first of all, what can injure the endothelial cells? They don't get a sprained ankle, right? They're not playing soccer and get a sprained ankle. They get injured from chronic hypertension. If your pressure is too high all the time, you wreck them and they get they get upset and start doing things they shouldn't do. If the tur if you have turbulent blood flow, maybe you don't have type of hypertension, but you have some stenosis in one area, like a garden hose with a finger over it. Uh, that region downstream with turbulent blood flow will injure and damage some of the endothelial cells. How about a vessel wall injury? Myocardial infarction can injure endothelial cells of adjacent blood vessels. Vasculitis, infection, a catheter procedure can damage endothelial cells. Some people are allergic to cigarette smoke particles that get into the bloodstream. They love to stick on endothelial cells, and you can get an inflammation an inflammatory, like an autoimmune attack against the inflammatory attack against those cigarette particles that can damage the endothelial cells. They get upset. They don't work right. Same with environmental pollution. That's really bad. Same type of deal with that. So who cares if they get injured? Well, if they get mad, uh, they stop doing some things which can lead to thrombus formation. Arterial thrombus, we talked about that again. It can, an emboli, that a piece of thrombus breaks loose from the inner wall of the blood vessel, that's an emboli, uh, causes, can cause a stroke. It depends where the emboli goes. It can cause a myocardial infarction. It can get stuck in the renal artery and cause a beaver dam there where the kidney doesn't get enough blood and the R2A system goes crazy. And you have general hypertension, but the, the stuck kidney will be happy because it has correct pressure. We'll talk about that more. Uh, vessel wall weakening, uh, aneurysm or a rupture of an aneurysm uh, if the inflammation process goes on enough. When endothelial cells get aggravated, they do two things. They get upset, but what do they do specifically? Uh, they release too much stuff. There's some dangerous products that they can produce or overproduce. And then they can stop producing like the slippery three. They're not produced anymore in an endothelial cell that's matter, that's upset. So they overproduce things like von Willebrand factor uh, and plasminogen activator inhibitor. These are prothrombogenic molecules. You gotta know that word right there, prothrombogenic. Pro means, yeah, it's gonna help make it happen. Thrombo is thrombus, so it's clotting. It's clotting on the blood vessel wall on the inside. So all of these can lead to thrombus formation or clotting, which I shouldn't say, but everybody says it, clotting of the blood on the inside of the lumen. And then there's the slippery three. They stop making, they stop spraying PAM on the inside of the blood vessel, so it starts getting really sticky. Okay, and all of these can lead to the formation of thrombus and therefore the formation of an embolus. All right, blood flow, I think that's it for today. All right, so let's keep our fingers crossed. I'm going to hit the double escape and hope it saved this recording. See you in the next video.